South Hills, we are thrilled to be going on a missions trip this summer. We'll be supporting the work of our global campus in Chumbi, Kenya, as well as our long-term partner, Tumaidi International. You may have heard me talk about the verse of the year, Acts 1.8, where it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, this is the perfect opportunity for you to put the ends of the earth bit to practice. There is nothing quite like pushing yourself beyond your comfort zone to serve others. And this summer, we are giving you that very opportunity in Kenya, Africa. The trip will take place in the summer from July 15th through the 25th, and the cost is around $2,500. Now I realize there's a lot more information you'll need to plan for the trip. So if you are interested in serving and ministering in Kenya, I highly recommend you join our upcoming interest meeting. This will give us an opportunity to share important details and answer all the questions you will have. So please scan the QR code on screen to register for the interest meeting. We'll hope you consider joining us in Kenya this summer. If you're visiting us for the first time and you do not know who the chubby guy on the platform is, that is me. Uh, my name is Efren Peña. I'm the campus pastor here at South Hills Santa Clarita. And it's truly an honor to have you here this morning. And my heart's prayer is that God will uh, grab you, your heart today, and take you on an incredible journey uh, and inspire you and encourage you. And that you leave here differently than how you came in. And so... We live in an era where there's total access. We have total access to all sorts of information, a seemingly endless supply of resources and an abundant amount of entertainment. And yet, yet, we still manage to find ourselves lonelier than ever. And it's not that we aren't around people. It's just that we choose to go at it alone. But it doesn't have to be this way, church. And it's not the way that Jesus intended for us to live. Rather than being a one-man show, we're invited to be in a band. Rather than, than an individual sport, we're invited to be part of a team. Rather than a solo commute, we're invited to join the carpool and live the life that we were designed and meant to live. This morning's message is titled drive throughs and Dining Tables. drive throughs and Dining Tables. And this is my, my little attempt here to, if we got a little light here, as an illustration of our little plants here. There we go. drive throughs and dining tables. The difficult work of communion. Um, do me a favor here. Shout out your favorite restaurant or your favorite meal. Come on. Sabor. Tacos. Mexican food. Four by four animal style. In and out. Yes. Anyone else? Sushi, barbecue, anyone else? Island Pacific. Oh, oh? Island Pacific. Okay, yeah. A lot of good stuff there. A lot, a lot of good stuff. I have a few of my favorite as well. Number, probably number one on my list or my go-to is pizza. I love pizza. Born and raised in New York. That's where the good pizza's at. All right, but love pizza. So I go around wherever I go. 
No matter where I travel to, I'm going to find a pizza sp- a place to, to try it out. I also love, I also love uh, steak and potatoes. Mm, good steak, seasoned well. Mm, that's good stuff right there. And I love me some Chinese food. Love me some Chinese food. But every year, every year, there's always one year, one meal that I look forward to having the most. One meal out of the entire year that I look forward to having the most. And that is my New Year's Eve meal. My New Year's Eve meal. Why? A couple of reasons. Number one, I'm, I'm too old for all the hoopah and the celebration and the, you know, like screaming and all that stuff. So I like to, to keep it low key. And so we have dinner at home. We have dinner at home. We celebrate at home. But we celebrate with Chinese food. Mm-hmm. Love me some Chinese food, all of it. Barbecue pork fried rice, barbecue ribs, right? We have beef and broccoli. We have chicken lo mein. We have honey sesame shrimp. We have the egg rolls. We have the fortune. We have it all. Mm, I'm hungry right now. So, so good. But the number one reason I love this meal is because me and all of my girls gather around the table. We have a round table at my house. This, we, didn't, we brought a square one here today. But we gather around the table and we laugh and we talk and we share about the past year and all of the ups and the downs and we talk about what we're expecting and hoping in this new year and there is and, and we we eat until we come into a food coma and, and we sit on the couch and then we we just we watch Ryan Seacrest on repeat like three times because we're catching it on the east coast and then in the middle and somewhere in California by the time California comes I'm already dead uh, right but I love this, this moment, this meal that my family and I and all the Pena ladies get to sit at the table. It is, it is so, so good. And at that moment, I feel like life is good. Life is good. Have you ever had a meal with someone that just blew all of your expectations? You went out and... And, and, and had a meal with someone and, and everything about it was incredible. And I'm not necessarily talking about just the food, right? Because food is always good, right? But I'm talking about the conversation, the company, right? It's good to hang out and do life with one another. Maybe you showed up for your reservation and, and wound up Staying past the restaurant closed. Maybe you, uh, um, you, you didn't know someone well. And in that conversation, in that company, you were able, by the time you left, you were like, man, I would like to do life with this person. I, I, I like this person. Anthony um, Bourdain, right? He's a, uh, he passed away, but he was a, a chef and an author and a curated a lot of shows, but he he put it best, I think, when he said, the perfect meal or the best meals occur in a context that frequently has very little to do with the food itself. I love that. Because it focuses on the people. Friends, a lot of incredible things can happen, can take place at a dinner table. And I think that's why Jesus spent so much time at them. Maybe the most famous one is often referred to as the Lord's table or the Last Supper. You know, the one where all of Jesus' friends got behind the table and said, cheese, right, for the painting. I always found that hilarious, right? They'd be like, really? Someone's going to take our pen? It's all, st- right, line up, line up, get there, Right? And if, you're, if my wife is the one doing the painting, be like, all the pe- small people to the front, all the big people to the back. But they all run around the table. I find that so uncomfortable when you go to a restaurant and I see two people on the same side of the table. I don't know why. Just so weird. 
Like, sit across from each other. Like, I don't know. Anyway, that's just me. But Luke chapter 22 tells us the story. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 20. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Friends, in every version of church that has ever existed, from the homes to cathedrals, from a cappella singing to modern rock bands, to the, the simple, the simple elements of the bread and the cup of wine has endured as marks of being Jesus' followers. When we think of communion, we can't help but think of Jesus' followers. When we think of the bread and the wine, we think of being a follower of Christ. But many of us do why those elements, why those elements or even meals at Dinner tables show up so often in Scripture. There are a few reasons why I believe this was such a crucial component of Jesus' life and why it should be a significant part of followers of Jesus. Church, we have to recognize, I want want you to hear me out, we have to recognize that Jesus' message is most clearly seen in the meals. Jesus' message is, messages are most clearly seen at the table. That might be the most clearly seen, and it's, and, it's, and it's most clearly seen in one meal in particular. In Matthew 9, chapter, uh, chapter 9, 9 and 11, it says, As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? We've all heard that story before, right? You see, in ancient Israel, the dining table was used to define a person's community and identity. Eating together in this culture was an act of mutual acceptance. You wouldn't eat, you wouldn't eat with someone whose life you didn't approve of. You wouldn't break bread. You wouldn't invite them to the table. And who you are with determined your social status. Essentially, the same status that the junior high cafeteria lunch tables have today. You have middle school students, you would would know. This table-based ranking uh, of society is critical critical to understanding Jesus' choices and actions. Now, we recognize Jesus as the Messiah, but most of his followers during his life were simply, they were simply enamored with him. They were enamored with him as a a brilliant rabbi and and an incredible teacher. Other rabbis and teachers, however, were disturbed They were bothered by his willingness and desire to sit at a table with tax collectors, with prostitutes, with other sinners. And this wasn't something a person of status and wisdom or holiness would ever consider doing. But Jesus did. Jesus was more than comfortable in that space, almost as if it was his plan all along. Each time Jesus sat at a table, right, each time he sat at a table, it was a way of showing, uh, showing the nearness of God 
to every single person and the desire to be in a relationship with them and with us today. It reminds me of the message uh, uh, paraphrase of John 1, 14, where it says the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. I love that. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Could God have shouted his message? Yeah. Could have got a bullhorn and shouted it. Hey, Jesus loves you. I love you. He could have done that. Could, have he, could he have hired a, a skywriter? Yeah, of course he could have. Write his message up there all nice and white. Could he have telepathed how much he loves us and his purpose and his plan for us? I believe so. Absolutely. He could have. But what did he choose to do? What did he choose to do? He chose to come close. He chose to be amongst us. He chose to move into the neighborhood and sit at our table as if to say, I'm here for you. I'm here with you. And I want you to know, I want you to know that more than anything else, I am here with you. Friends, everything that separates us from God is removed, and the dinner table represents that. It shows his eagerness to welcome everyone to his table, even those farthest from God. So the Pharisees, <laughs> they were upset with Jesus. They were upset with Jesus who, 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 who shared his meals with these kind of people. But it goes on to say in verse 12, when Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people do not need a doctor. Sick people do. The Pharisees, the Pharisees saw a rabbi defiling himself among sinners. But Jesus wanted them to see a doctor healing the sick. By simply sharing a dinner table, Jesus was bringing healing. Bringing healing. Friends, when we are loved and when we are accepted for who we really are and welcomed into the life of another person without conditions, it brings healing to our souls. It does something incredible for us. Every one of us, every single one of us has been wounded through this journey we call life in some, at, at some point, whether from relationships, whether from choices we've made, experiences we've had, judgments or rejections. We've all been wounded. These things often leave scars that we can kind of carry for years. But as we break bread and pour the cup at the Lord's table, we are reminded of Jesus' wounds and discover that our wounds are welcomed at the table as well. The final words that Matthew tells us about that meal are important as well. In Matthew 9 verse 13, says, then he added, Jesus saying, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call those who think they are righteous, but those, uh, not to call those who think they are righteous, but those who know that they're sinners. In other words, show mercy. Don't just offer sacrifices. Show mercy, don't just offer sacrifices. Showing mercy requires us to be around people. 
Showing mercy requires us to be around people. Offering sacrifices does not. It's too easy and too convenient for us to focus on the offering sacrifices part of our faith because we don't have to deal with the messiness of others. But Jesus is putting a priority. He's putting an emphasis. He's putting a spotlight on how we interact with others how we welcome others, how we serve others, how we love others, how we encourage others, and how we build others up. It's as if he's saying, don't get too confused. Don't get too caught up on your own holiness that you think you can disconnect from others. One author put it this way, says, the table is not ours. The table is not ours, it is the Lord's. And the community he is building looks nothing like the one we would choose. I love that. Because we can get caught up in this, in this table that it has to look a certain way, that only the invited few that fit the mold can sit At the table. But it's not your table. It's the Lord's table. The Apostle Paul wrote something in the book of Galatians that is often overlooked, but it speaks to this very same idea. Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. And it says, but when Peter came to uh, and it's like he, he, I had to oppose him to his face for what he did was wrong. When he first arrived, he, he ate, right, with the believers who were not circumcised, right, the Gentile believers who were not circumcised. But afterward, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. So let's, let's read into this a little bit, okay? Peter, Peter happily shared a dinner table with the Gentiles until, until other Jewish men showed up. So he was good, sharing the table with the Gentiles until people that he saw that understood things were scholars, right, until they started, they showed up. Then he wouldn't sit at a table with them anymore. He wouldn't sit with the Gentiles anymore. They all believed in Jesus, right? They all believed in Jesus They all shared the same faith. So what was the issue? What was the issue? Friends, Peter, just like us, wanted to be comfortable. He wanted to be comfortable. And like us, Peter wanted a comfortable church filled with the people he preferred. Filled with the people that He liked. He wanted the communion table to be occupied by people who shared his identity and his views. In other words, he wanted to offer sacrifices without having to show mercy. I'll let that sit there for a second. He wanted to offer sacrifices without having to, sh- to show mercy. Author Parker Palmer said it this way, in true community, we will not choose our companions for our choices are so often limited by self-serving motives. Instead, our companions will be given to us by grace. Often they will be persons who will upset 
our settled view of self and worth and world. In fact, we might define true community as that place where the person you least want to live with lives. Wait, 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 Pastor E. Pastor E, are we talking about communion together at church or are we talking about who we need to invite to the dinner table? Yes. Yes. The Last Supper wasn't just communion. That painting that we've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of time wasn't just about communion. It was a dinner. It was a dinner. It was a meal that had spiritual implications. Jesus' meal with Matthew and his party friends wasn't just a hangout. It was a meal that had spiritual implications. Peter's awkwardness about mixing friend groups at mealtime just wasn't about another dinner. It was a meal that had spiritual implications. Church, we so desperately want to separate or compartmentalize our faith from our lives. We do that. Some of us do it consciously and others do it subconsciously. We separate those things, but that's just not how God designed us. That's not in us. When we take communion together at church, it's intense to be a practice and a reminder that God pursues a relationship with us and that healing, healing is available to us and that wholeness is found when we sit at the table with others. But also, some of you rarely, if ever, Invite anyone to your dinner table at home. Mm -hmm. You're busy. You're busy. You're preoccupied. You have preferences. You don't like what other people like. You're worried about what you might be able to offer. You're worried of if your house is clean or not. Unfortunately, Jesus' kingdom is one that is built around a dinner table. That's what his kingdom is built around the dinner table. And you are missing out on crucial aspects of your faith and your relationship with God by your limited time, excuse me, by your limited table time with others. by your preferences for drive throughs mm, I'm speaking to somebody this morning. You prefer drive throughs than to have people sit with you at dinner. One of the biggest cracks that I saw in the church, the modern church today, was several years ago when COVID hit. You see, we're so used to going back Sunday after Sunday. We go one Sunday and we don't see people to the following Sunday and so on and so forth. But when the doors were closed to the church, guess what happened? You were at home lonely. And you realized that you had not spent enough time building relationships, foundations with people in your church. You didn't do life with people in your church, so there was nobody table with you. It impacted you. There was no deep relationship. There was no depth to your relationships with the people that you did life with on a Sunday. 
It is so evident in Jesus' life and in the writings of the apostles and even in the first church that intentional connection around a table is crucial, a crucial component of experiencing the full life that God intends for us. He intended for you to sit at a table with somebody. He intended for you to break bread with people. And do life with people. He didn't want you to go through the drive throughs That's not what he wanted out of you. He didn't even think about that. He wanted this, a dining table, people around the table, because that is where people found healing. That is where people got what God wanted them to have. It's so difficult to do that when we're going through the drive through When we're paying less attention to people. When we're fixated on, oh, I only invite people that like this food. Oh, I only like people that look like this. I only invite people that act like this or speak like this or are in my social status or make the same income as me or like the same things that I do. Because what else will we talk about? You can talk about Jesus. You could talk about what he's done in your life. You could smile and laugh, share funny stories. You can share about how God has been good to you. You can learn from each other. But that cannot happen if you don't invite someone to the dinner table. So let me wrap this up this morning. Friends, today we're gonna, today's communion Sunday. And as every communion Sunday, we like to take communion. So I'm gonna ask the team to quickly distribute the elements. Because God has invited us to his table today. All right? He's invited us to to break bread in in the form of this little cracker and this cup of juice, very small cup of juice. But before we take communion together, I want to give you your plan of action. Right at Southfields, we... And every message with a plan of action, a next step, if you would, a practical step on how we can take what we've learned today and put it into play. I'm not too fond of places where you go and they give you something to think about and process it for weeks and weeks. I'd rather be a doer of the word of God. I'm not so focused on, man, did you memorize that scripture? Or did you act that scripture out? That's my heart. And so uh, like every other Sunday, I want to give you a practical step. I want to help you take what we've learned today and put it in your life and make it happen. And so it's real simple. It really is. I want you to take note of the last time you included an outsider and make a list of three people you like to invite to your dinner table. Simple as that. First part is reflect. Man, who's, who, who the last per, who's the last person I invited to come and join me at the dinner table? And then make a list of three people. Put into play three people, three, three families, not, not all at the same time. Maybe you don't have a house that big. My table only fits six, and there's already five of us. (laughs) So you're either going to sit on the sofa, on the floor, right? I invite you, but you don't got to invite everyone. Three people, three families that you want to invite. And bring them home. Bring them to your dining table. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter if they come to church or not. It doesn't matter if they work with you or not. It doesn't matter if they live in your community or not. 
But find three people that you can break bread with. Because at that table, people are going to find healing. Maybe it's the person that you're inviting, the family that you're inviting. It might be you that will find healing. But God purposed and intended for us to live in relationships. And he gave us illustration after illustration after illustration. But the best place to do it, the best place to be around, the best place to find what we're looking for is at the dinner table. Because you know what I find interesting and and I believe it all my heart, that this table that's in your home can lead to this table that's in this church. Call me crazy. What I do know is that I'm not making it up. What I do know is this is the word of God. Let's invite you. Let's invite people to our dinner table. So I want to take communion together right now. I want to take communion right now as a family at this dinner table where the presence of God is here. But I want you to have communion in your home with people that you know, with people that you care about, with people that don't dress like you, with people that don't act like you, with people who don't think like you, with people that don't go to church like you. And I'm not talking about waiting for a birthday. I'm talking about let's do it this week. Adjust your schedule because it's that important. And I'm not talking about having this little juice and crackers for dinner. Bring out the good stuff. Bring out that that long time recipe that everyone loves. And sit at the table with others. Engage in the meal that has spiritual implications. Amen? So let's take communion this morning and recognize the sacrifice that was made for us and the significant, the, the significance and the importance of taking communion together as a family. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to take communion today as a family, to sit around your table that you invite us to. And Lord, may we take heed to this message today to invite others to our dinner table this week and the following week, and the week after that, and that it would be something so common for us to share a meal with others. Because that's where we will find what we're searching for. Because that dinner, that meal, that sit down, has spiritual implications. And Lord, I pray that if there is anyone here today that finds themselves outside of a relationship with you, outside of the dinner table with you, Lord, if there's anyone here that is just struggling to believe
Lord, we want to invite them to say yes to you or say yes to you again. And I pray that you pull and tug at their hearts at this very moment, Lord. And let them know, Lord, that you want a relationship with them. And if you are here this morning and whether you find yourself outside of a relationship with, that you once had with Jesus or you have never said yes to Jesus, we want to take this journey with you today. We want to connect you with the one who will forgive you of your sins and love you unconditionally. And that is you. That is you. Please raise your hand. We won't single you out. We won't make it awkward. We just want to love on you and help you in this journey. Amen. Lord, I pray that today we leave here differently than how we came in. May you get all the glory and all the honor. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Church, let's stand up and worship him for a few more minutes here. South Hills Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that he's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gifts and talents and abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to, to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because a Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give, and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that he can bless and anoint your finances and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you and thank you for watching our online service today.